Coming up next on Headline Humble, the Yurok tribe has recently released four California condors into the skies above their reservation, returning a sacred species to the center of their universe. We'll bring you that story. Also, key contributor Eric Black brings us the details from a Humboldt County Planning Commission meeting this week that centered around the fate of a fish farm proposed for the Samoa Peninsula. Coming up now on Headline Humble. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Good news, really good news, is hard to come by these days. But tonight, our interview and main story is just that. Good news that helps me, at least, remember that humans are occasionally capable of doing good work and improving the world around them. For generations and generations, the Yurok tribe, like many of the tribes around here and elsewhere, has performed an annual ceremony to ensure world renewal. It's an ancient and sacred practice that they believe helps to keep the world in balance. One creature that is emblematic of that process and sacred to the Yurok people is the California condor, the largest land-based bird in North America and one that disappeared from the North Coast skies more than a century ago. That is, until very recently. In a partnership with Redwood National and State Parks, the tribe has recently reintroduced the endangered condor to North Coast skies. Four birds were hatched, raised from birth, and released as part of an effort to restore the species to our area and help the Yurok people restore the natural balance here and across the planet. A natural scavenger, the condor has a very specific role in ecosystems, helping to recycle the biomass of large marine mammals that are too thick-skinned for normal scavengers to break down. By restoring the condor, the tribe and its partners have once again done their vital part in assuring the restoration of balance and health to the cycles of life and death that propel every second of our life here on this blue planet. Now, the interview. I saw, I sat down via Zoom with wildlife biologist Tiana Williams of the Yurok tribe, and she described the program that ultimately led to those four condors being released over Yurok lands. So the Yurok Tribe Wildlife Department is a department within our Natural Resource Division in the Yurok Tribe. And so we are a collaboration of various natural resource departments who are committed to holistic and traditional ethic based um, restoration of Yurok tribal lands and all the associated cultural values that go along with that. Mm -hmm. Being the wildlife department, obviously we focus quite a bit on wildlife, both in terms of assessing and conserving and caretaking our wildlife populations, restoring those who have been locally extirpated like the California condor um, and working for, towards habitat restoration, which is really what uh, wildlife restoration needs in this area. But the wildlife department itself actually got started with our primary goal of bringing California condor or Priganish back to Yurok ancestral territories. And they were locally extirpated about 130 years ago, but are deeply culturally important to not only the Yurok people, but many tribes in this area and tie particularly to kind of this regional ethic that tribes have of being world renewal people. So it's very important to that cultural value. And so that decision was made by a panel of our elders who were specifically tasked with identifying cultural and natural resource restoration needs and who chose Preganish as the single most important land-based species to bring back to our territories because of that cultural importance. So that was in 2003. It took us a little bit to kind of get started, but eventually we were able to get funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to start a feasibility analysis uh, about what it would take to bring condors home. So that demonstrates, I mean, a 19 year commitment to get these birds back in their range on your country. I would say even longer than that, since since certainly our elders, as they watched condors disappear off their landscape, would have immediately started praying and, and hoping for a better time when they came home. But certainly I'd say active 19 years we've been at it. So can you uh, describe for us, I mean, obviously, you know, we're pretty ignorant of the uh, cultural, you know, background for, for these birds, for the Yurok tribe, but can you give us a sense of what their significance is for tribal members? Well, it really does relate to that fundamental ethic and kind of our reason for being as world renewal or fix the earth people. And so condor features very heavily in our creation stories, um, in the development of the ways that we consider our duty to be world renewal people, for example, our world renewal ceremonies and the like. Mm -hmm. And so he actually provides a song, uh, which is a prayer for us that we sing in these high ceremonies. Uh, he provides his feathers through gifts 
um, that we use in our regalia. We believe that brings his spirit into the dance. And we feel that he carries our prayers for the world to be in balance all across the world when we're, when we're conducting these ceremonies. So while we continue to dance these ceremonies, this ethic still is our primary reason for being, there's been a major cultural wound with not having Condor here uh, directly to, to engage with these ceremonies. So now there was three birds, is that right? That have been let loose on the, in the area. Can you describe those for me? Give us their names and anything that you might be able to share with us in terms of insights about their character or anything else? There's actually been four birds released now. Four birds now, okay, cool. Uh, yep, uh, designated if you happen to be out and about and you see one, um, they're designated A0 through A3 through these visual tags that they have. Um, and we have one female that's A0 and three males, A1 through A3. The first two birds to be released were A3 and A2, and we provided each of our birds kind of nicknames um, to welcome them into our local community again. Mm -hmm. And so A3 was the first out the door. He was a little bit hesitant when we were first releasing him, kind of, what's up with this open door? Is this a trick? Are they really going to let me out? Um, because he'd previously been held in our, our flight pen until he was ready to go out into the wild. Yeah. Uh, but then he just jumped out and took off and actually went <laughs> on a tour of the area for about two weeks before he decided to come back. Wow. But so we nicknamed him Poitwasan, which means the one who goes out ahead or is also a traditional name for our headmen or the leaders of our villages. And he's definitely proven to be a leader in our condor flock. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very shortly followed by A2, another male. And A2 was named Nesquichop, which in Yurok means he returns home. And of course, that's indicative of the fact that this is the first time condors have really been home in well over a century now. Yeah. Uh, the third to be released was A0. She's our female. And she was named Negem Nchwinkah, which means she carries our prayers. Mm -hmm. And so that's a reference both to the fact that condors are believed to carry our prayers for the world to be in balance. And because we're all praying for her, her and her siblings and all condors out there, just, um, just that they be well. And when I say siblings, I mean that in a not in a biological standpoint, yeah, yeah, these guys yeah. actually aren't that closely related, but they are a very close cohort. Yeah. Uh, the last bird to be released was A1, also a male, and I named him or nicknamed him La Paulet, which means finally we fly. And so that's a reference to all the birds coming together, finally our first cohort all being in the air. Yeah. And the poor guy himself, he got delayed by a month because his transmitter was faulty. And so it's like, oh, no. finally, I get to go out and be in the sky. Uh -huh. These birds are uh, relatively young birds. Uh, they're two and three years old. And they came directly to us from the captive rearing uh, facilities at the Oregon Zoo and at the Boise World Center for Birds of Prey. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually the first time they've ever out, been out and about in the wild. But they're doing great exploring their their new home and and learning what it is to be a free-flying condor. So now you have mentioned a transmitter, so you will be monitoring them in terms of movements, and will there be any checkups or anything in terms of um, their health and, and that sort of thing? Definitely. Uh, condors are incredibly important. Uh, they came to an all-time low of just 22 individuals, and through concerted conservation efforts have been brought up to over 500, about over 300 of which are actually in the wild. So every single bird that's out there is monitored as closely as possible. Mm -hmm. All of our birds carry both a satellite transmitter, which pings periodically and kind of gives us an overall view of how they're using the landscape and where they generally speaking are at any points. And they also carry a radio transmitter. And the radio transmitter is really for us as, as kind of their human support. We send out crews just about every day to try and get eyes on the birds to make sure that they're healthy and well and uh, make sure that they don't need any support. And that's something we'll continue to do um, pretty much indefinitely or into, at least until it's established that they can make it on their own without our intervention. But beyond that, we're also going to be doing biannual trap ups uh, to do more direct hands on checks for their health, make sure that they're not injured any way or ill. Yeah. And so our we'll be doing that in our, our condor release and management facility, we call it. That's where we release them from and it's where we'll continue to monitor them from. Uh, and that's out in, in Redwood National Park. Okay. Um, can you give us a sense of what kind of birds condors are? Are they scavengers or are they birds of prey? I mean, how do they eat basically? 
Definitely. So scavengers is the word for a condor. They're actually the largest uh, land-based bird in North America, making them the largest scavenger as well. They've got a wingspan of nine to nine and a half feet, and they can weigh as much as 25 pounds. They're obligate scavengers, which means that they only feed on dead things that they've already found on the ground. And so uh, scavengers like condors or like uh, the turkey vultures that we also have in this area are incredibly important for keeping the environment cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, I know for myself, having grown up in Crescent City along the coast, there, the particular ecological niche that's almost completely unfilled right now without condors is actually a large scavenger to come in and start breaking down those thick-skinned, blubbery marine mammals that our smaller scavengers just can't get to. Oh. And so I'm really looking forward to them uh, taking on that cleanup crew yeah. job as well. Yeah, excellent. Now, when they were, were they raised with an eye toward ultimate release? I mean, is there a process that they underwent where it's like you slowly uh, acclimatize them to having more and more freedom? Or can you talk about that process a little bit? You know, honestly, I am not nearly as ex expert in the whole rearing process in the rearing facilities. They have been doing this for decades and they are absolutely incredible. But every single chick is monitored from its inception to um, its release to its death. Um, and so every bird we have, we know who its parents are. We know when it was born. We know how it did as it was growing up, a little bit about its personality as they were coming to us. I know they do their best to try and keep them as, as basically dehumanized as possible, which is something that we also do. Sure. As with any wild animal, you want to keep them as wild as conceivably possible. But so they are chosen based on their lineage, on their genetics, on their age, uh, sex distribution and things like that. Uh, not only for us, but for all the rest of the release facilities uh, in California and the Southwest. And so we came to, they came to us with a little bit of, with a little bit of knowledge of um, what it is to be a condor because they grew up with um, other condors in these rearing facilities. Okay. But we were also blessed with the loan or the visit of a mentor bird from the Boise World Center of Birds of Prey, oh. who came along with the birds to kind of give them those last finishing touches of what it is to be a condor, a wild condor, an adult condor before they were released. How do you guys, you know, uh, assess their chances in the wild? Is it something that, I mean, with the, with the interventions and the monitoring, is it pretty much assured that they're going to succeed? Or are you <laughs> overly concerned about that? And I imagine success uh includes ultimately breeding in the wild is that right mm -hmm. i mean honestly it's hard to say yeah we do know that they thrived here historically um we have not like i said not only us but all the tribes in the area have a strong history with them and we've got the locations that they used to hang out in and and we know the ways that they used to use the landscape and the landscape has changed quite a bit yeah. and so we did a lot of habitat analyses going in to make sure that things seem sufficient and they and they mostly do but there's a lot more human pressures these days than there used to be. And that's probably what drove them out in the first place. Unfortunately, the uh, largest inhibitors of condor success seem to be humans. Um, the number one cause of mortality in the wild is actually lead contamination. And it's the use of lead ammunition that's been implicated in introducing lead into the environment. They're scavengers. So when a hunter will go out and will harvest food, um, they'll more typically than not, at least historically, use a lead, a lead rifle round, which fragments heavily on impact being a soft metal. On the one hand, it's really good for the hunter because this sort of mechanism actually carries um, these little bursts of kinetic energy throughout the animal and gives a clean knockdown, which is what any hunter wants to see. But when it gets into the gut pile, which a hunter will usually leave behind and which is otherwise really good food for scavengers. That's one of the important gotcha. roles that hunters yeah. play. If it's studded with lead, it's extremely toxic to not only condors, but bald eagles and golden eagles. And so there's been a couple of approaches to that. Um, California has actually put a full fledged ban on the use of uh, using lead ammunition for hunting in California. Mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly not something that is probably gonna work on its own really the success of condors are going to be reliant on um, what's actually a really strong hunter conservation ethic and not only in our area but in the rest of california condor recovery because of course 
these are folks who like to be out in the environment. They like to have a beautiful landscape with a full yeah. complex um, diversity of wildlife out there. And so there's a lot of voluntary outreach to our hunting community as well. Our own program is called Hunters as Stewards to provide hunters with the information about the impacts of lead, many of whom don't know the impacts of lead and then provide them information about alternatives, uh, primarily non-lead or copper ammunition that they can use and which is just as effective as more conventional lead ammunition. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest challenge that's facing condors right now. Uh, but I do think that with time, it's gonna be ultimately completely uh, surmountable. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard a lot about and I'm sure that you think a lot about uh, is the sort of the decline of um, species diversity across the planet. I mean, we have a lot of species that are, um, you know, becoming less and less common and uh, more and more endangered. Um, how does the Yurok reservation area, you know, how is it doing in that regard? And if, uh, you know, if this works with condors, do you have other species in mind of uh, reintroductions that might take place? Um, you know, next, I guess. There's definitely been a lot of implications for species diversity on tribal lands. Not too many species have gone outright extinct, mm -hmm. um, though there are words in traditional language for birds that we can't seem to correlate with, with modern flocks anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, even though our landscape has been changed dramatically since, um, really since the California gold rush, and there's a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. um, most of our species seem to be at least hanging on. Okay. But for example, uh, the beaver population, which is incredibly important for ecological health, is mm -hmm. very small compared to what it used to be. We'd love to be able to bring more beavers back into the area. Yeah. The porcupine population is almost nothing of what it should be. And so we'd love to be able to bring porcupines in. Yeah. But even species that are doing abundantly well in the region, like our Roosevelt elk population, are not doing as well as they could be on tribal lands because our lands were taken and completely reformulated. Yeah. And so there's no longer the habitat to support them. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to kind of make our, our homelands and bring it back to health. Yeah. What kind of range do you expect these birds to ultimately achieve? Are there, is there like an average range that you're thinking they'll settle mm -hmm. into? Well, thankfully for right now, they're our peace of mind. <laughs> they're sticking pretty close to home. Like I said, this is their first time out in the wild. So they're kind of figuring it out. But once established um, around a home territory, they can fly as much as 100 miles in a day looking for the resources they need. And if they really want to get from point A to point B, they can fly as much as 200 miles in a day. Wow. So definitely a far traversing sort of bird. Is there any, uh, if someone wanted to, you know, see these birds in the wild, uh, where would you recommend they go or would you re not recommend that at all? Well, I definitely hope that they're going to become um, wide ranging and abundant enough for people to go and view them. Uh, typically speaking, you're going to want to be looking in the Redwood National Park lands. They really like redwoods. They really like open prairie lands and the like. And they've uh, been utilizing uh, both of them in Redwood National and State Parks. So if you're wanting to look for condors, that's where I would go and look for them first. Okay. Uh, how were the uh, Redwood National and State Parks as partners in this? Absolutely amazing. So I mentioned we got our first funding to really get the project started in 2008. But we went to them even before we got that first funding and said, hey, we think we've got this really amazing conservation idea and we think it would support your goals for recovery as well back in 2007. And it was at that point they said, we agree, that would be an amazing sort of project. And so they've been helping us out with staff time to do habitat analyses, providing us funding for that sort of thing. Um, they helped us as co-leads along with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the environmental assessment process. And when it was determined through habitat analyses that they actually had some of the best areas for constructing a release and management facility, they said, yes, let's do it. And so that's how we ended up actually being both within Redwood National Park and Yurok Ancestral Territories as kind of a, a com combined conservation and restoration area. For you personally, what have you found the most satisfying about the, this process? I mean, uh, are you a Yurok tribal member? I am a Yurok tribal member. I live in the Crescent City area, but my family traditionally comes from the village of Wishwell, which is on the mouth of the Klamath on the south side, uh, near the near the Klamath, town of Klamath. And so for myself, it's really kind of, um, it's the generations that bookend me. 
So on the one hand, I have a four-year-old daughter and she absolutely loves Preganish. She's always asking for videos. She's always asking for pictures and stories. She had an opportunity to go up and meet the birds. And I was so proud of her. She was so quiet because we told her you can't talk so the condors can't hear you but she's just almost vibrating she's so <laughs> excited but same thing i've given tons of talks to kids in our areas about why condor and, and conservation is so important and at this point i go and give new talks and the kids are telling me about condors because i know that they're excited or i'll talk to my elders particularly those original tribal park task force members and i look up to them as people i really admire and respect but when they turn that gratitude back to us for actually making this happen, I can't even put that into words. It's just incredible. So is there anything else you'd like to add? I mean, that pretty much covers it from my perspective, but if there's anything I didn't ask that you think people should know, please. Uh, we just always like to share that um, if you want more information, you can go to the Yurok Tribe uh, wildlife website. It's yuroktribe.org slash wildlife, or we also maintain a Facebook page if you look for the Yurok Condor Restoration Program or the Northern California Condor Restoration Program. That's kind of the joint collaboration between us and the parks. And we also have a live feed for our condors that's currently focused on the release and management area. And since they still hang out there quite a bit, uh, there's great opportunities to, to watch and learn about the birds there. It's stories like that that make me love my job. Um, we'll be right back after the short break. In a frontline special presentation. Hundreds of civilians have been killed in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. A dramatic look inside Russia's attack on Kharkiv, told by the people living through it. The displaced families, civilians caught in the fight, and those risking everything. Let's go. To protect them. You can call it any way you want, but it's a war. One of the largest potential job creation projects in Humboldt County continues its way through the maze of process and regulatory approvals necessary for final construction. Dozens of stakeholders packed the Humboldt County Courthouse last night to debate the future of the Samoa fish farm. Headline Humboldt's Eric Black reports. If approved, Nordic Aqua Farms will invest $650 million to raise and harvest roughly 150,000 daily pounds of Atlantic salmon. The fish would live their entire lives indoors, on land, in tanks, at the site of the old Louisiana Pacific pulp mill. Right now, the vacant export we have out of Humboldt County is our children. All of my children had to go out and go to work someplace else. I support this project, and the sooner we can get it off the ground, the better. They're taking a dilapidated, contaminated pulp mill, and they're going to turn it into a viable industry. And they're going to supply 300 construction jobs, living wage jobs, and then going forward, 150 full-time jobs that are also going to be living sustainable. And I've watched projects come to Humboldt County over the last 25 years that I thought were very valuable projects, and I think we've had a culture of no on every one of them. We sent away the LNG, the Terrigen, the, even, even the balloon track. This is a great project. We have, we have to change the culture and bring these companies here. It's going to be something that's in their community, something that they can show their kids, something that you can see a fish at the, fish farm, at the supermarket and go, hey, I worked on building that project. It's not only put uh, food on the table, it's literally putting food on the table. But that food comes at a steep price, according to environmental critics. What will be the effect of the massive amount of effluent, even though treated, being deposited in the ocean in sensitive areas for salmon, which as you all know are endangered here? Nordic will remove roughly 99% of solids and 90% of nitrogen before dumping fish wastewater into this outfall pipe, which empties a mile and a half out at sea. At that location, more than 12 million daily gallons of 71-degree wastewater will mix with the ocean's 52-degree water. The county says wastewater dilutes quickly. Water quality will be restored beyond 5 feet of the discharge point. The effluent will not affect Humboldt Bay. Under the project's environmental impact report, Nordic can wait to monitor discharge until the farm's full operations begin, which could be a couple of years after discharge begins. 
But we suggest that this condition be amended to clearly state that post-discharge monitoring will begin as soon as discharging begins, and so that we know that the discharge is not affecting biological resources or contributing to harmful algal blooms. The company's interim CEO verbally agreed to that request last night. It's unclear whether the Planning Commission will make it a legal requirement when the public hearing resumes next Thursday. Eric Black, Headline Humboldt, Eureka. Thanks, Eric. New legislation from North Coast Congressman Jared Huffman and others that could help Northern California and similar areas around the country deal with unprecedented drought and resulting wildfires passed the House of Representatives this week. At a press conference following passage, Huffman outlined why this bill is so vital for helping communities get through these environmental challenges. As my colleagues have said, we are uh, undeniably in a climate crisis. And if you live in the West, uh, wildfire and drought are very much on our minds right now. Uh, they will be all summer. And in my district, they have been each of the past five summers. We've had terrible fire seasons, the kind of horrors that Representative Leger Fernandez just described that are going on in New Mexico have been all too common in the north coast of California. Every fire season for the past five years, people have lost homes and businesses. Lives have been lost in my district. So uh, we have work to do, and this crisis is only getting worse. Uh, so uh, Mr. Nagoose and my colleagues here, thank you for your leadership in bringing this package together. I'm grateful that Democrats have been laying the groundwork and building legislation to meet this moment. This package is full of transformative bills. I've worked on many of them with my friends and colleagues, and I want to just quickly talk about one in particular. It's a bill I call my Future Drought Act, and at the heart of this bill, um, it's just all about communities to help them respond to uh, water shortages, prepare for future water shortages that are driven by climate change, which we know is making drought more frequent and more severe. And it includes investments for truly drought-proof infrastructure, improved water technology, ecosystem protection and restoration so we can reduce water conflicts and stretch our water supplies in a responsible way and job training and education for folks in the water sector workforce. If you talk to water managers around the country, you hear that there is a great need for this investment uh, in water. If you're a dog lover like my wife Amy, you're going to want to see this. After a car wreck Thursday smashed a fire hydrant and saw the partial flooding of US Highway 101 south on 4th Street between T and S Streets, firefighters were able to save one very precious life. As you can see in this video, the firefighters had to be very careful in the extraction of the victim, a furry, four-legged friend that certainly looks like a pug. It was pulled from the wreckage and ultimately returned to its grateful owner. The video was captured and shared on Facebook by Jennifer Pifferini, who has graciously allowed, it, allowed us to share it with you. This is yet another example of good news on the North Coast, made possible by hero firefighters working hard to save a life, no matter how tiny. That's it for tonight. Remember, if you've noticed a problem in Humboldt County, send us a tip at what's wrong with Humboldt at keeptv.org. Stay tuned, stay informed.